So I'm, I'm astonished at how quickly we are at this moment. Um, that is our, our last uh, topical speaker, um, who is Brendan Burke. Um, I'm, my, I'm, my mind is reeling at the diversity of, and you know, really wonderful and interesting uh, work we have heard about. Uh, this, I'm looking forward as well here to Brendan's uh, presentations. He is, I would say, the most Western of all of us in terms of what he's going to be talking about. Um, and Brendan is an archaeologist who has a deep experience in one of Liz's area of expertise, and that is uh, through Anatolia through his uh, contributions at Gordian, which we have heard about already. Um, although I would actually characterize him as a specialist in uh, the Aegean Bronze Age, even more so. Um, and he particularly thinks deeply about the economies of making textiles um, and also in textile evidence. And so, as we've mentioned already, like Liz, you know, he's a passion for the small finds, the telltale signs of bigger, more complex and often lost uh, processes and skills that underlay their creation. Um, for about a decade now, Brendan has been doing field work at ancient, I hope it's pronouncing it correctly, Elion maybe, but well, we'll find out in a second, in Boeotia, in Greece. Um, and next year, he's going to be the professor in residence at the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, uh, taking a break from his duties as associate professor at the University of Victoria in Canada. So please help me welcome Brendan Burke. Thanks very much. You can all hear me okay? Okay, great. So I will um, share my screen now. So yes, we're all getting used to uh, the Zoom way of life. <laughs> Um, so I'm very grateful for the invitation to uh, be here today, and um, of course, I, you know, in a way, I wouldn't, of course, I wouldn't have missed it. Um, and I, I think I'd like to just, re you know, it's making me reflect on all of my time at UCLA. And I think one of the things I, what I'm remembering, and what I think we should all appreciate again, and I think Liz is a perfect example of this, is that no archaeologist works alone. And it, even when I was recruited by Liz and Sarah Morris by phone. Uh, when I was in England, um, that was so funny. Uh, we didn't have Skype. <laughs> we didn't have, we barely had email back then, I think. Um, that was really fun. And I, I came to realize that UCLA was a very special place. And when I started there, you know, it was just a really great period of time. And I see Helly Guyry is on the, on the line too. And I thank her and Ernestine Elster, Sarah Morris, of course, but also Jim Hill and um, Tim Earl were there and Richard Leventhal and so it was just such a great period of time and I'm very grateful to them and also to my collegial graduate students um, Bradley especially and Stuart and Lynn um, you know it just was a great time and so I, I, I I'm very happy to be here to remember those times so today what I'd like to do is um, talk about ancient Elion uh, this is a project I've been working on for quite some time with my co-collaborator uh, Brian Burns at Wellesley College uh, we are a Synergasia, a collaborative project sponsored by the Canadian Institute in Greece and the effort of antiquities in Boeotia. Um, so you can see that my colleague Brian Burns and our funding agencies, um, the Social Sciences Humanities Research Council and INSTAP, which is so key for Aegean Bronze Age studies. Um, so what I wanted to do today is highlight some of the aspects of our excavation. And um, But before I do, I found this um, great part of my personal archive. Again, before email, we have some letters. This was a letter Liz wrote to me in 1993 when I was thinking about a dissertation project. And uh, she gives me some great helpful advice for finding accommodation in Ankara, that was useful. And then it was all about me going out to uh, Gordian and potentially to work on the survey project there. And I guess I had said, are you sure? Like I was an insecure graduate student, are they gonna like me? And she, to her very direct Midwestern bluntness, she says, I'm not really sure if they will like you. <laughs> so I kind of like that. Um, but what she, they ended up liking me okay, I think. And I, I ended, I, I formed a very uh, fruitful uh, professional relationship with Mary Voigt, the director of excavations at Gordian at that time. And uh, because of Liz's connections and networks, it was very networking. It was very helpful to me in terms of my career. And um, I was able to write a dissertation partly based on the textile evidence from Gordian. I also, again, fully with Liz's help, 
uh, she suggested I go to the symposium in Ankara one year in the late 90s uh, because I wanted to start a survey project around the site of Doom Wreck. And I know she always loved that name of that site, Doom Wreck. We laughed about it. And, and I even came to visit me with um, Alif Danel. Um, and then I began a, a, a small phase of excavation at Gordian as well. So um, I, I, I can never divorce Anatoly, of course, from um, my, my recollections of my work with Liz. But as Lynn mentioned, I am um, heavily based in the Greek world. I, I identify in many ways as an Aegean prehistorian. And um, so what I'd like to talk about today is mostly focused on the Mycenaean age. This is a period from about 1700 to 1050 BC for central Greece. Um, and the, the Mycenaeans of course were, well, I always, I like Liz's perspective on the Mycenaeans too, because she would sort of, as a classicist, we thought the Mycenaeans and the Minoans were the greatest thing. And she would say, you know, they really, the Hittites and the Egyptians barely even knew them. <laughs> they didn't uh, amount to all that much on the, in the world scheme of things. There certainly were international connections and lots of foreign imports. Uh, Ostrogeg, Rita, for example, worked by the Minoans and Mycenaeans, uh, ivory imported. The source of gold has been a continuing debate. And even the silver stag that comes from um, Grave Circle A at, at uh, Mycenae. This is fairly clearly a, a, a Hittite import to these, this very elevated group of people who were buried inside uh, Grave Circle A at Mycenae. So in other parts of the Mycenaean world, here's the, the, the country of Greece and all of these areas in pink have Mycenaean evidence. Uh, we can see the various centers. Um, one of them, the, the Cadmeon, the Palace of Cadmus at Thebes, also shows a great deal of evidence for um, imports from the Near East, including the, the somewhat famous cache of cylinder seals made up, made up of lapis lazuli. And um, I think it's always a great uh, assignment probably for Liz, Liz's students who come from the classical or Aegean world to give them this as an assignment because it makes them start studying the Kassites and the Hittite and the Mitanni um, for this unusual deposit of this very, very wealthy hoard of material found at a Mycenaean center. Um, and here again is that ivory pyxis, that ivory um, little uh, jewelry box from Thebes as well. So we are um, working at a site that is not uh, a major Mycenaean palace. Um, we are, it, the site is called Ancient Elion and we are in the area east of Thebes, the palace of Cadmus that I just mentioned. Um, Elion and Eastern Boeotia lies between uh, Athens or Attica is just down to the south of us. You can see from this Google map. Um, and it had, it's a site that had not been explored before. Um, and so our work there was um, uh, sort of starting very fresh and new. Um, what we did have was Linear B tablets from the center at Thebes that were very helpful for understanding the geography of Eastern Boeotia. Um, included among the tablets that were found, FT140 lists a place named Tekaya, which is Thebes. On the fifth line, we actually hear a place name called Et Reoni. Um, I took Linear B at UCLA with Jan Puvel. Those were great times also. Um, we can see that um, Arione is a site, Elion, with the R changes to an L, within the orbit of Thebes. So we knew that there was a site that we also hear about it in classical sources as well. Um, so with my collaborators, we began a field survey. And this also, I, I'd like to think I imported some methods that I had learned from the Karamanmarash survey uh, back in the 90s. Uh, that we employed in Eastern Boeotia to explore this, this landscape um, around uh, Thebes. Tanagra is nearby as well. And um, Arma is the other village where we explored. So we did a preliminary field survey, collected a range of material from the medieval period all the way to the late Neolithic, um, early Bronze Age, and then Mycenaean and Archaic as, uh, were, were, the, were the predominant uh, results of the survey. Um, our attention always focused on this site. Uh, this was an elevated plateau in the Acropolis. Is it working for you all? You can see it? Okay, good. Um, and what was in the landscape was this polygonal wall. This wall had never been explored by archeologists. And so, we, and we did a field survey above and we knew that there was something significant there. So starting in 2011, 
uh, we began our excavation trenches at, uh, at the site. Um, what we found was material from the medieval period, primarily with this tower off to the west, um, archaic and classical remains, but the majority of material dated to the Mycenaean age, both the early and the late Mycenaean periods. So you could say from the 16th century all the way up until the 12th century. Um, and so it was a, a multi-period site um, without uh, much from the Roman or um, um, Hellenistic periods uh, at the upper level. So it was, a, it was fortunate for us, we were able to get to the prehistoric levels fairly quickly. Um, here you can see the um, site from our, one of our drone or early drone efforts. Um, what we were surprised to find, we thought we were focused mostly on the late Mycenaean settlement remains, and uh, we'll talk about them in just a second. Can you see my pointer? Probably not. Let me see, I'll get the... Let me get yeah, that. we can see your pointer, Brendan. Oh, okay, great, thanks. Um, what we were surprised to find was a uh, early Mycenaean burial complex. And so we'll move in chronological order from earliest to latest. Um, here is a, another one of our digital models. This is a, was a somewhat stunning discovery for us. We did not expect to find a, a Mycenaean grave enclosure. We call it the blue stone structure. There's shiny blue stones that outline, uh, delimitate this space for separate people within the community that were buried inside. Also remarkably, we have these standing grave stele, two grave stele that don't mark individual tombs necessarily. They seem to be marking the whole space. Um, and we've explored, they don't mark one tomb, they mark the multitude of tombs that, that are in this area. So you can see several of the tombs that, as we've excavated them so far from this, uh, this digital model. And let me just highlight just a few of the, the tombs we've explored. The largest one was tomb five. Um, it's a uh, L-shaped uh, chamber tomb. The capstone had collapsed. We had help from the Greek um, ephoria in lifting these, this very large block, uh, this capstone that collapsed on itself. Um, our colleague Nicholas Herman from Texas State University has been working with us on the analysis of the human remains. Tomb five had multiple individuals, very common for the Mycenaeans, commingled remains brought all together. So this tomb was used, closed, and then reused again for more for family members. And the older members who were buried first were pushed to the side, and then the last individuals to go in were are more articulated. In, in, the, in this burial. And that's the case for all of them as well. For our chronology, we, we have very good examples of whole pots from here, starting with the gray minion vessels, some matte painted ware, um, polychrome, and then some early Mycenaean ware as well. So all of this dates to about 1700, 1600 BC. This is the shaft grave era. This is the period of the early Mycenaeans. So the results were very um, fortunate for us. Um, if we're looking at Eastern and foreign contexts, um, one of the finds from tomb five is this, uh, which we were excited to find. Uh, this is a uh, ivory sword pommel. This is not the sword that we found. We didn't find the bronze sword that go went with it, but it was a port piece of imported and very sophisticatedly crafted ivory uh, that formed the pommel of the, of the sword. Um, in other burials, we found beads, some of the rock crystal ones like this one with a, a flying fish item or uh, uh, image, uh, similar to something you'd find in wall paintings at the Aegean, like here at um, Philaco P. Um, but, and the last tomb I wanted to look at with you is tomb 10. Uh, and we'll see what is the big deal. What's so exciting about tomb 10 located here in red on the screen. Um, I give you just a nature, the nature of all of the tombs we find, they are, the, here's one of the grave steely. Um, we have this cobble layer, this very beautifully laid cobble stone layer. When we lift up the cobble layer, uh, we proceeded to excavate further below. Our team of students were convinced, uh, we were also that there would probably be a capstone underneath that, those cobble layers. And there was, this was about, it's about two meters in, in height, very, very large stone sealed this tomb um, very well. We found two unusual unfired clay pots in the far corner here. Um, 
but more remarkable within the tomb, uh, we found uh, bronze jewelry around the wrist. Um, we well, we found three individuals, um, two adults that were the uh, initial occupants of this tomb, and they were their remains are over here. They were pushed to the side at a, in the second use phase, and a young child was a medium age child, ten years old, was placed in the tomb, uh, which you can see the remains of here. Um, with those, with that child separating them from the adults was um, a very unusual find for the Aegean and exciting for me, uh, some remains of prehistoric textiles. So we think this might even be the earliest example of wool, among the earliest examples of wool from the Aegean. We've done electron um, microscope analysis of it. And for lots of reasons, we think it is um, uh, wool that could have wrapped the young child. So that was a very exciting discovery just in 2018. Okay, but for the settlement remains, uh, we look elsewhere, you can see the blue stone over here in the Northwest and the Southwest. Um, here you can see our Northwest area. Um, we've certainly continued to collaborate with, um, our, uh, with, with people from UCLA and, and, and that's been very helpful to us. Uh, a PhD student, many of you know, I think he's online, Trevor Van Dam, worked primarily on the household remains at uh, late Bronze Age Elyon, including the Northwest house, which we just saw, and uh, the southwest remains uh, over here where the pointer is. So um, as I highlight just some aspects of the um, late Mycenaean remains, you can see there's an LH3C um, deposit that Trevor and Hans Bernard have looked are analyzing this bathtub here for residue analysis. The drinking vessels that were found here in these, this post-palatial level helps us understand what's happening at these centers after palaces like the Cadmion are destroyed. Um, here you can see some of the very fancy and beautiful um, drinking vessels from um, Elion as well. Um, we have more imported objects from the east, the blue glass beads at the top, um, maybe made from objects like the Uluburun shipwreck ingots you see on the bottom. Um, but even more excitingly, we found a, a, a jewelry mold um, on the left here, and you can see the design on both the impressions on both sides of this jewelry mold. And th these are very rare. Uh, only a few jewelry molds are known from the Mycenaean world and usually from workshops associated with palaces like Mycenae. Um, gold beads, which you see here, which may have been covered in, um, which may have been internally made of glass, uh, are found at the Cadmion and they fit very well with our mold here. It's hard to say that there's a one-to-one -one connection that these beads were made with this mold, but it sure does look that way to me. <laughs> Um, and then in terms of religious material and cult action that might be happening with these households or other areas of the settlement, uh, we have material from both the palatial and the post-palatial levels. Uh, we have figures, bull figures, and, and, and these are somewhat rare in the Aegean, but they are often associated with cult activity uh, and this um, large scale figure of a head, which may, probably was a large scale standing figure. Okay, but who's the Anatolian in the title of my talk? Um, here in the Southwest, one of our early discoveries in 2012 came this um, unusual head, this image of a human figure, very, very small. This is the palm of my glove at the top here. Uh, so he's only about three centimeters in height. Uh, and w initially we thought it was ivory. Um, and then our uh, faunal analysis, uh, and then it was reconfirmed by um, Adam de Batista too, that this was, oops, sorry for that stretching there, uh, was made from animal bone. Um, but I always thought we like to talk about the bone head because we find that funny. <laughs> um, what we see in the, um, with this head is that it would have been um, inlaid into something. Uh, maybe it was a composite figure of a, of a cult object perhaps. Its eyes, as you can tell, are inlaid sits on a, um, and also the, that human head I mentioned before that maybe a cult figure could indicate that there is some ritual activity going on in this area. Stratigraphically, it dates to the 3B period, 3B2. So somewhere around 1225 to 1200 BC, we might say for a date. Um, and we're fairly secure on its, uh, on its stratigraphic level. So that helps us with our dating. Oh, you can see we did, PXRF analysis, Vanessa Muros was very helpful in that, just to examine what the eyes were made out of. 
Um, as I said, we think they are inlaid with glass. We look for Comparanda within the Mycenaean world, the ivory triad at Mycenae perhaps could be something that might be similar. Um, we, there's an other ivory head, but we were never really satisfied that there was a connection between the two. Um, I looked at in the East, um, something like this from Megiddo from the late Bronze Age, roughly the, the dates might work out um, with the looking at the style of the eyes and the carving of the eyebrows, for example. Impossible in terms of the stratigraphy might be something from um, Southern Anatolia, like this, um, the Bayander tumulus, the priestess woman with the young children of the seventh century. Um, but then maybe there's this other find we have, that I've noticed bringing us back to central Anatolia, neighbors of the, of the area of Phrygia yeah, around um, Afyon. This small Hittite divinity made out of bronze, you know, I just put the suggestion to you, the hairband here, the way the eyes are carved, and, um, the nose, the flatness of the nose, and the very small mouth. You know, is it possible that this um, small bone head could be something that um, came into our site from, from the east, from further east? I don't know. We're still working on it, let us say. Um, but one of the things I've learned from, um, from my, my colleagues, or from my experiences at UCLA, of course, is community engagement. And I think we've seen some of that from the work at Domus Tepe and elsewhere. Liz was certainly involved with the, the people you are, who are hosting you as, as investigators of their, of their past. And this is some of the illustrations of the work we've done at, at Elion as well. I list all of my partners here, or some of them anyway, and you can see there, there are, there are um, it's a large team. Um, we've been fortunate, as I said, to have good funding agencies. Here are just some of our teams over the last few years. Um, I, and we are very grateful to the help we've received, both human and animal, as you can see on the bottom. So thank you for your time and your attention. And uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to um, take them. Thanks.